it's kind of weird. The book was published in Dutch in my mother tongue uh, early 2014. And then um, early this year, the Turkish version was published and now the English version. And I thought I, I was very much in a hurry to get the, the translations done because I thought maybe it's going to be outdated if, I'm, if I don't hurry. But I think it's not, unfortunately, not outdated at all. And if you think, w look what's going on now in Turkey with, with the renewed violence, um, that renewed violence is not in the book. But still, the book explains v very well what is happening now, too, and why the violence flares up again. If you, if you get the, the, the bigger picture, if you zoom out a little bit what I do in the book, then you, uh, do you understand today's um, troubles, too, actually. Um, yeah, like Aga said, like you all know that I was thrown out of Turkey. Um, and of course, now I've been reflecting very much on why, why that happened, how it happened. Um, because it came as a shock to me, which was kind of, some people were surprised about that. Like, didn't you see it coming? No, maybe I was in denial. I think I was. Um, but now that I look back, I, I do think I could have seen it coming. I think when I actually started investigating this book, when I started it, I didn't know it was going to be a book yet. But um, now in retrospect, I think the, the moment that I, I went to Roboski for the first time, five days after the massacre, um, then actually th the collision between me and the state was you know, it started the state from there, me from there, <laughs> and eventually we were going to, to crash. Um, but I didn't realize it then. But I would like to read a small part of the book um, about how I, how I actually decided to, to go there. Um, it, like Aga said, the uh, massacre happened end of 2011, 28th of December 2011. And sometimes it's weird for me to read this back because it's not even four years ago. And, and if I compare my level of knowledge at the time and now, it's, it's such a tremendous change. So this also um, yeah, shows what kind of questions I had at the time. So the massacre happened at night. Next morning, um, I read on Twitter that it happened and I saw the pictures. And it was end of December, so um, that's where this piece starts. I spent the last few days of the year glued to the television, on Twitter and perusing the newspapers. The images of the funeral on 30 December affect me deeply. A great mass of people is moving through the rugged snow-flecked mountain landscape towards the burial ground. A ribbon of 34 coffins draped with the Kurdish colors red, green and yellow, visible in the crowd. 19 of the dead are under the age of 18. 26 are from the NG family. It touches me deeply, but at the same time, I understand so little. Who are these smugglers? What are they doing there on the Iraqi border, even though it's well known that the PKK has its base camps there? Why would they take that risk? And young lads of 12 or 13, do they really get, out, get sent out for smuggling? And if so, why? There's another thing I don't understand. Many of the victims come from families of village guards, armed villages who pass on information to the army, who are supposed to protect their village against the PKK and who can <coughs> be called up to join the fighting. All this for a fixed monthly salary and a Kalashnikov from the state. If they were working as village guards and thus receiving an income, why would they smuggle? As far as I know, the village guards are despised by many other Kurds. Yet another question keeps going through my mind. Was this bombing accidental? If the Kurdish media is to be believed, the smugglers were in close contact with the local army posts and they always turned a blind, blind eye to the smuggling. In fact, the army posts were said to always warn the villagers about any planned anti-PKK activities. So smuggling could be postponed for a couple of days in the interest of safety. Was that true? Had that not happened this time and why not? Within a couple of days, media coverage becomes completely, completely polarized, as is always the case in Turkey. The Kurdish media loudly declared that the bloodbath in Uludere was not an accident, but a deliberate murder of Kurdish civilians. I'm sort of appalled by the overblown rhetoric. How could they possibly reach such conclusions after just a couple of days? About five days pass, and I can't stand it any longer. 
what am I doing in Istanbul when 1,700 kilometers away, whichever way you look at it, the Turkish state has committed the biggest massacre of Kurds for decades. I pack my suitcase and call my assistant Beda. Are you coming with me to Uludere? We meet the next morning at 5.25 a.m. on the first flight to Diyarbakir. So I think that's, that's actually when my trouble started. Um, and, and for that, I would have to um, first go back to when I f initially uh, came to Turkey, which was in 2006. I was educated at Journalism Academy in the Netherlands and I worked there as a journalist since uh, 1990. So I was an experienced journalist, but I was totally um, yeah, educated and grown up in, in Dutch journalism. So I, know I knew journalism, but I didn't know much about Turkey yet. I've been traveling to Turkey for two years already before I moved there. But Turkey is a complicated country and um, it would keep me awake at night sometimes because I really didn't understand. Also, um, definition-wise, I would get arguments with Turks about democracy and it turned out that we would have a totally different definition of democracy or what is leftist, what is rightist. Some people seem to be so left that they turn out on the right hand side again. Or what, what is a minority? Um, all these kind of things first need to be redefined before you can start to understand what's going on there. Um, so when I also when I look back on the stories I wrote at the time, uh, only for Dutch media, then journalism-wise, there's not much wrong with it, but it doesn't it doesn't have almost um, um, usually doesn't have the depth that stories need or that they get when when the correspondent gets to know the country better. And I I um, I wrote about Kurds as well, but kind of average stories like this side, this side, you know, average that any any. Um, Turkey correspondent could make and and that's the group that I was in at the time like the the group of the the average foreign correspondent in Turkey and I had opinions at the time because I'd always been as a child already been interested in human rights so I had my opinions but I didn't really express them because like what I said I didn't know the country well enough yet so then you you shouldn't have opinions yet because if you, if with friends, I would have discussions about my opinions, but they would, I wouldn't verbally be strong enough to counterattack their sometimes appalling ideas because I didn't know Turkey well enough. So I thought I cannot put this on paper and put it out in the world yet because I'm, I'm not strong enough yet in my opinions. I don't have enough background yet. Um, and I just came freshly in from Holland. And if you then start spreading around your opinions, it's rather orient orientalist thing to do. So it's better to first also talk to all the groups in, in Turkey. I talked to na nationalists as well, who would um, vote MHP at the same time, say the Kurds are our brothers. And I thought, well, you know, how, how the hell does that work? And if you, I slowly, slowly found out how it works for them. And then I got to know Turkey better and then opinions were easier to share, but that's later. Um, so I had I had these questions that I went to Roboski with, but I, I only um, went once initially, just one day even, to make two news stories. But I felt I had to go back that I didn't know enough yet. I had so many questions that remained unanswered. But the good thing was, um, I felt very free to do my work since I was part of that group of foreign journalists in Turkey. I had my I had my press card, I had my residence permit, and I could it it said on my residence permit Basin, so press. So I also at checkpoints in the southeast, they could immediately see I was a journalist, but they never they never blocked me. They were always friendly, and you know, so I felt very free to do my work. Um, and there's an, there, when it comes to Roboski and for, for all the, uh, also when you look now at the Ankara mas massacre, for example, you have the domestic press, of course, the other, the other big group of journalists in Turkey, but they also cannot um, report the news 
uh, properly. Of course, there's all this um, all this dynamics that um, that the that the domestic press is in with uh, ownership. I don't know if you know most most of the newspapers and TV channels in Turkey are owned by big companies who are also in construction, in telecom, in mining, in all these branches. So if you want to win tenders by the government, if you want to do d business with the government, you will have to you have to stay within the state narrative to to be in the game and to earn money. So none of these media are actually made for journalism reasons. They are only made for economic reasons to to enhance the other businesses. So there's no independence there. Um, so they couldn't report it properly, but um, for the foreign media, it's it it was actually difficult too. I remember the stories that I made the first time I went to Roboski, the news stories that I made. You have to put all the um, alleged, reportedly, uh, Kurdish media reports. You have to add all these words because you don't know yet for sure. And if you only have Kurdish paper as Gündem to base your story on, according to international journalism standards, that's not enough. One source is no source. That's not enough. So you have to add these words like it's unconfirmed, it's reportedly, it's alleged. Which is good. That's a good rule, of course, to, to do it like that. And, and I use these words too in my initial reports. Um, and the, um, the Kurdish press was, of course, widely reporting about it. But the problem is and, and that they are not, in, in general, not very much trusted by the outside world. I, I also compare it a little bit to when the Gezi protest started in Istanbul. Of course, the Turkish press were not covering that properly at all. And soon the Gezi protesters themselves made, they, they made a, made a um, basic studio and they started their Gezi TV. Their logo was a penguin, of course, because some Turkish channel broadcast a penguin documentary when, um, when Taksim Square was burning. But the problem is they are only being watched by the other Gezi protesters. And it's the same with the Kurdish media. Now, uh, Sterk TV is here. The average Turk doesn't watch that terrorist channel. And they don't read Özgür Gündem. They don't... Um, and also for international media, it's hard to trust them because they are considered close to the PKK. So can we trust their information? So it's hard to get to get that story out. I've, For the last years, when I've followed the Kurdish press, I've hardly ever caught them lying, I have to say. So I've, I, every year, I've, you know, in the, in through the years, I've learned to trust them more. But in general, they have this problem. Um, I was talking about the international standards, like you have to have two sources and you, um, and so in the beginning, you, you have all this alleged reportedly kind of words. But now, when you, when you read big pieces about the Kurdish issue, in Turkey, then often um, Roboski they refer to Roboski massacre because it was after the Dersin massacres in the 30s. It was the biggest murder on Kurds in like in one in one um, attack. So it's often referred to, but they still all the international media still write um, between two commas the Roboski massacre in which smugglers were mistaken by PKK fighters. And it's not true. That's really not true. It was it was not an accident. It was not. Oh, I thought we thought they were PKK. It's not. It's just not true. And when I started, um, only after investigating Roboski for a year, I had this idea like, hey, this could be a book. But I, when I started investigating it, I felt like um, I was doing some very difficult journalistic investigative work. But it turn, turned out that it was not so hard at all to find to find out the basics. You have to go to the village, you have to talk to people. You go. I went on the smuggling route also to see if it's true that the military is there. Um, you can be in the village and see that the mules of the smugglers are going on the same road as the military vehicles to the army post on the mountain next to the roads that the smugglers use. So have been using for decades already. So everybody knew that the smuggling was going on there. And there's many other reasons um, to believe that it was not an accident. 
and any foreign journalist could find that out in a day. In a, you need maybe two if you want to go there too. But they still write in which smugglers were mistaken for PKK fighters. And I do hold that against them. It's really, it's, it's really bad, really. And I talk to them about that too, uh, to my colleagues. Like, why do you write that? Why do you write that sentence? Why don't you write, you know, the states, which the state said was an accident, but there's reasons to believe that it wasn't, for example. Um, and they say, yeah, we, we, can't, we can't be sure that it wasn't an accident. And we cannot be 100% sure because there are many, uh, there are a few reports, especially one important report from the Interior Ministry, but they are secret. All, all investigations in Turkey who that matter into killings, mass killings or from one person, they are, they are secret, which already tells you so that they have something to hide. Also with Ankara, Ankara massacre investigations now also secret. Um, so we cannot be 100% sure that it was not an accident, but everything, everything points in everything that we can know points in that direction. So if you keep um, using that state narrative like it was an accident, then you're just spreading the. You, you think for, if you come from a country where the authorities are are actually accountable for what they're doing, it could be reasonable to take the authorities version as you know to explain something like that but in Turkey that's not the case so they also don't have any proof for that sentence for saying it was an accident there's no proof for that either so why do you choose the government narrative if you know the authorities in Turkey that makes no sense um, so that's that's a problem with the with um, that one source is no source I totally agree on that but you have to have two sides of the story they say which is um, which is cool in countries like my country Holland or in this country where where governments are accountable where you have a, a freedom of information act Turkey doesn't have a freedom of information act they can stamp anything a secret and nobody has the right to get any information um, or in a country like ours, l like yours, like mine, where um, where the government doesn't speak out about the media. If my prime minister would say anything about the media, he would be attacked by everybody. Shut up about the media. But in Turkey, it's happening all the time, every day. And also, you can't ask uh, authorities any um, critical questions in Turkey, of course. They, they do get interviewed, but just by the channels and the newspapers that are owned the biggest biggest government newspaper Sabah is the the company that owns Sabah is run by the son-in-law of Erdogan I mean that's how bad it is it's ridiculous you can't imagine that in the democracy but in Turkey it's happening um, so this this international journalism rules actually um, makes the government lies go go unquestioned and they even get spread again and again. And the, and the foreign media cannot really adjust to that reality because they can't change their standards to the situation in every country in the world, like how we're gonna handle this or that. I think they could do it more by adding other sentences to explain something like Roboski massacre, but they don't. Um, so I'm rather glad that I'm I'm a journalist in, in these days where you can have your own publication platforms. So, and when, where we have Twitter, I don't know if I, you know, lived in a time without Twitter. <laughs> so you can, you can spread news there, you can spread your opinions there, you can, you can gather a following and, and spread the, the stories that you can't spread elsewhere. And I am still working for mainstream media, of course. I, I work for, uh, for the independent, for the BBC and for mainstream media in Holland also. Um, but there, at least I can pitch my own stories. This story is important, needs to be told that way, and I, I influence that. I'm not a staff member or something that has to abide by all their... So I can, I can find my own way. But also I have my own platforms, like on Twitter and on my website, and I'm, I have this page on uh, American website Beacon Reader. It's a, it's a crowd-funded site, and I can publish my stories there. And there I try to... Um, I try to do 
what journalism should really be about, and that is finding the truth. And it's not about writing, um, Ali says this and Aisha says that. Uh, then you have these two opinions or two versions of the truth and what, you're gon what you should do as a journalist, who's right? What, why is he saying that? Why is she saying that? What's behind it? And that's what I try to do. Um, and and it, takes, it takes time. I like to call it slow journalism, which, which is what I always like, to like, like most. I, I make fast news stories as well, but slow journalism gives you more answers and you have more time to investigate. Also for the book, I also read a lot about the Dersim massacres because the people in Roboski were comparing the Roboski massacre to Dersim. And I was wondering why they were doing that. So I could investigate that and, and talk to experts about it, academics about it. So I do follow the journalism rules. I, I, I talk to people who are um, independent and what, what is the truth about this massacre? So I try to find the truth and, and, and publish that. And um, one of the truths I discovered is Roboski massacre was not an accident. And then you can, the authorities can say like one million times like it was an accident, but it's not true. And because of this and that and that reason. And then only you really inform your readers. Because what, it's no good for a reader to say, the villagers say it was not an accident, the president says it was. What are you, what, what, it's no use to read that as, a, as, a, as somebody from the outside, as a reader. You know, you're not going to get any wiser. You want to know who's right. So I, that's what I try to figure out. And also in, in investigating all this, when, when I look back, like I said, to the questions I had when I went to Roboski for the first time, I'm surprised that it's, that it's not even four years ago that I had these questions. But now I've learned that, um, that the Kurds are actually right. They do have, they do have the rights, every nation, the, the United Nations has treaties from the 50s and the 60s actually. In the first article it says, nations have a right to self-determination. So that's, sort of starting point for my opinion, um, for my opinions about that. Nations have that right. And it was written down in the time when Africa was decolonizing. And that process is over now. And Turkey's still in it, in, still in, it in 2015. They're still not giving their nation. It's, you could call it a colonization in this time. Kurdistan is being colonized. And, and the UN treaties against colonization are from the 50s and the 60s, and Turkey's in 2015 still didn't solve this problem. So I think the Kurds, the Kurds are right, they do have this right to self-determination, and the only way to solve the Kurdish issue is to give the Kurds what they are entitled to, which is self-rule. Now, last week, in Aga, in the east of Turkey, the uh, election brochures from the HDP were confiscated by the local governor because it had the word self-rule in it. Can you imagine, like somebody on Twitter said to me, somebody from Britain said, can you imagine that the SNP brochures are being confiscated by the British state because it says, not even self-rule, they want independence. It's unimaginable in Turkey, but it should be, it should be free to have such, such demands. They are legitimate demands. <coughs> and also when you talk about the peace process, um, like the Kurds say, we are entitled to self-determination and the state says, but the PKK has to lay down its arms first. So as a reader, who are you going to believe? The whole Kurdish issue is already, especially since 9-11, being more and more framed as a terrorism issue, but it's not. But people have this feeling like, yeah, terrorists have to lay down their arms, of course, we're against violence. That's fine, but if you then what you do is, okay, who's right? You're going to investigate how do peace processes go? A peace process, you're in, a, in an armed conflict, then you have a ceasefire, which was, <coughs> unfortunately, is not anymore, but it was there for two and a half years. During the ceasefire, you negotiate. You sit down and you say, how are we going to solve this problem? In Turkey, it means we, we are going to write a new constitution. Um, we're going to set up some kind of system in, in which the Kurds can rule themselves. Do we do that for the whole country? Do we give the North? The Black Sea coast, coast also more um, regional rights, probably that would be a good solution, but that has to be negotiated. And if you have this new constitution, if you have a deal, then 
the armed movement lays down its arms. That's the logical, natural, always followed order of peace processes. So Erdogan can say now the PKK has to lay down its arms. No, not, that's not the case. That's not how it goes. First you solve the problem, then you lay down your arms. And when I write that down, people say, oh, Frederike Gering wants more blood to flow. No, of course not. I totally support the ceasefire it, and it has to be reinstalled as soon as possible. But then sit down and take this peace process seriously so that eventually the PKK can, can stop, this, can stop the, the armed struggle. Um, and, and I think it's really a very a, a big point that international media often, often miss, that, that they don't um, zoom out a little bit and, and give this extra background information. You hardly ever read about it. Um, so I actually think people often accuse me of not being objective. That's always the, the thing, journalists have to be objective. I don't think objectivity exists in the first place and I think you can have a... Already that I decided to move to Diyarbakir and um, yeah, live there and take that perspective from, from Kurdistan perspective already shows very clearly what I find important. So there's th there you go already with your objectivity. I mean, so I don't think it exists. But and, and you can have an opinion, I think, as a journalist about a subject that you know something about. Sometimes people ask me opinions about other issues in the Middle East, but I always say, I don't have opinion about it because I don't know enough about it. What do you think of the cooperation now between Russia and Assad? You know, I don't know. I can say something shallow about it, but that, that doesn't contribute anything. I can, that's the kind of news that I spread on Twitter for example, but I don't speak out about it fiercely because I don't know enough about it. But about Kurdish issue in Turkey, I know enough and I think it, it adds to, to the information to show your opinions and to base them on facts. I always have like uh, argumented uh, opinions there based on something. But I think actually what I do in this, in finding the truth behind the both the positions is actually like the the summum of objectivity because you find out what the truth is and that's what journalism should be and that's very objective like hey there's a UN treaty it says this and that the Kurds are entitled to have that is that not objective I think it is but by working this way and by looking from the Kurdish perspective and which is also not strange by the way if um, the Gezi protests were going on, that was kind of funny, the, the, the Gezi protests were going on and I wasn't going to Istanbul, I thought the whole international press is in Istanbul is there, so let's, I, I will stay in Diyarbakir and see how it is perceived here. And I wrote a blog post about it, based on a banner that I saw, there was a support demonstration in Diyarbakir for the Gezi protest and the, um, the banner said um, the, the castle of uprising is uh, greeting and supporting Gezi. I thought, yeah, the Kurds have been in an uprising for 30 years already, so you cannot hold it against them that they don't rush to Gezi to, to support the uprising there, because they are running around doing their own uprising already for 30 years. And I wrote a blog post about that, and somebody in Holland criticized me for it, saying, Frederike, this is Gezi, not everything is about the Kurds. But I say, but I'm in Kurdistan, so I explain the perspective from Diyarbakir which is in the same country and people are complaining that the Kurds are not joining Gezi enough. So I'm giving you the perspective from Kurdistan. It adds something to all the opinions coming from Istanbul. And if, and if a Berlin correspondent explains why the Germans do what they do, nobody will say like, not everything is about the Germans. No, it's a German, Germany correspondent and he or she explains the Germans and Merkel and everything. I explain the Kurds and Demirtas and Öcalan. So that's not subjective, that's, that's the journalism that I chose. But it has sort of um, taken me out of that group of the general um, foreign correspondent in Turkey, because I don't do what they do. But of course I've also not entered the other group, like the domestic, the domestic journalist. I'm not a Turkish journalist, I don't work for the corrupted Turkish media, and I also don't work, I've 
I've several times been asked, like, can you write something for um, Asa Diavelat or something? But I explicitly don't do that. Um, I, I stay independent and I don't want to be, I only write for this uh, independent website, DKEN. I have my, my uh, column there. But that's really independent, totally independent journalism. So I thought, okay, I can have, and it's nice to be part of the debate in Turkey too, to publish in Turkish there. So I'm sort of, I'm not in that group anymore that I was initially in after when I arrived in 2006, but I can never be in the domestic group either, which makes it, um, which it makes it harder also for the aut authorities to place me anywhere, like what's she doing here? What the, you know, they can't really pin me down. Um, but it also makes me more part of the whole polarization in Turkey because I'm not writing like the international press with, with all their, you know, with all the mistakes I already explained. <coughs> so I'm part of this polarization, which the pro-government media says I'm a spy and um, I'm a provoca provocator and a terrorist friend. And um, end of August, I went to Jumhuriyet newspaper, one of the one of the few really independent newspapers in Turkey, and I interviewed editor in chief John Dundar because he's in a lot of trouble because he tries to he tries to hold on to real journalism. He said it's practically impossible because we are getting law new law cases against us every week and it's, it's it's really hard for them but after the interview his secretary made a picture of the both of us i tweeted it next day this picture was on the front page of one of the government newspapers saying the provocateurs are coming together against the government or something like okay that's how it goes you know um it, it only shows actually that I have nothing to hide. I, s I, I always share pictures of who I talk to. I also talk to Jamil Bayik, the, the leader, PKK leader in Kandil, to Bese Hozat, uh, his uh, colleague, uh, also the leader. I share the pictures and the, and the anti-terrorism police asked me in, uh, in January when, when I was first detained, they showed me this picture that I put on Facebook myself, me with Jamil Bayik shaking hands with PKK flag behind us. Um, did you interview this man? <laughs> yeah, obviously I did, and I pub published published about it. I mean, it's not a secret. I I think it's very crucial for journalists to to work openly and transparent and not hide anything. So I have nothing to hide. So I I tweet these pictures without hesitation because I think it's okay for for journalists to interview Jamil Bayik. And journalists go there all the time. Everybody talks to him. And what is so what is a pity? And and I wrote a column about it too that they say that that's propaganda for a terrorist organization. But what they should do is invi invite me to Ankara to come to talk to the government. And I did do an interview request to uh, Yalcin Akdawan, which is an AKP guy who is really very, the last few years has been one of the key figures on the government side um, in, in the peace process or the ceasefire. And I'm totally ignored. I don't get an answer, nothing. But if I would go to Ankara and interview him, I would shake his hand like I did with Jamil Bayuk. I shake people's hands when I interview them. F I find it rather normal. I would shake his hand. I would make a picture of it. The Turkish flag would be behind us. I would tweet the picture. I would sell the interview everywhere. I'm sure I could sell it in many places, international media, Dutch media. I would be making propaganda for, for the government side of the story. But they don't, they don't let me, they, they sent the terrorism police to my house. If they, if they had some sense, they would talk to me. And, and I would like to talk to, to all actors in this, in this um, issue. I would like to go to Imrala too, I have some pressing questions from Mr. Öcalan as well. But nobody can go there, no journalist can go there. Not even anybody can go there at the moment, by the way. So I'm, as a journalist, I want to talk to all the sides, but the only side I can actually go to is to Kandil, because they are always willing to invite anybody. And that they're holding that against me, saying you're not objective. No, if you invite me too, then I'll tell your story as well. So by the pro for the pro-government media, I shouldn't say pro-government, I should just say government media. Um, I'm a spy, a provocator, a terrorist friend. Um, and then there's people who work for more like independent press, also internationally. S somebody reviewed my book and um, referred to me as a 
pro-Kurdish journalists. And that really, like the whole pro-Kurdish adjective, I can uh, give a whole separate lecture about that. I can really, uh, it's ridiculous actually. Um, I'm, if I'm pro anything, it's pro human rights and pro giving, giving people their, giving people their rights. And, and it's the same as calling the HDP pro-Kurdish. It, it makes no sense. Everybody keeps doing that, the pro-Kurdish party. And I, I understand it's, it's easy. You have, it costs only one word because newspaper pieces always have to be short, short, short. So it's only one word, pro-Kurdish party, HDP. But it doesn't do justice to the party. It's just not right. It's, it's not a right way to describe them. I always, I usually call them leftist party with roots in the Kurdish political movement. Okay, I, I counted the words, I think it's like six, six words longer or something, or seven words longer. And if you have to shorten your piece, you make it pro-Kurdish. But I think it's wrong. You cannot describe a party wrongly. It's not okay. It's, if you want to tell the truth, if you want to, to tell the story the way it is, you cannot just say like, oh, pro-Kurdish, then people know more or less what it is. No, you shouldn't do more or less in this important case. So I'm not pro-Kurdish. Um, and Kurds, they in general think I'm on their side. Um, well, I am, but um, not because it's Kurds, actually. People, that's also the pro-Kurdish thing. It's not about pro-Kurds, it's about pro-human rights. But I'm on the Kurdish side because um, because what I said that I think the Kurds are right, that their demands are legitimate. But the starting point of my work is human rights and, and journalism. And I happen to have discovered that the Kurds are right. So in that way, I'm, I'm on their side, but it doesn't make me like pro-Kurdish or anything. And being not in any of these groups, so it makes me part of the polarization, but then um, also there's, an, there's another um, dynamic that you have in Western media that totally doesn't exist in Turkey, and that is self-regulation. Um, when, when journalism functions in a country, which is usually when a country is a democracy, you have a, you have a debate among journalists and readers and other actors, not the government, but all academics, anybody who, who consumes media, about how the media function. So, for example, after Charlie Hebdo um, attacks or after murders by Islamic State or here in London when Lee Rigby was murdered, you discuss how are we going to bring this news? Um, are we going to show the dead bodies in the 6 o'clock news or better in the 10 o'clock news or not at all on the front page, on the third, place, uh, third page, in, in color or in black and white? These things are discussed in detail in the, in the newsrooms. Um, and they should be. And the readers also sent their letters. Um, I, d I don't want such pictures on the front page. And then, you know, there's a debate about these things. Um, and in Turkey, that, that doesn't exist at all. So you cannot, um, as soon as you try to do that, um, when I try to criticize, because I do mingle in the debate in Turkey, when I criticize a government newspaper, or I've, uh, some time ago I criticized Jumuriyat for something, then you're immediately put in what, it's not seen as a journalistic debate, it's put in this polarization as well. So if you say you report wrongly about the PKK, oh, you're a terrorist friend. No, I'm raising a journalistic issue here, but that just doesn't exist in Turkey. And sometimes th that's also why, um, like the, the, the most, obvious lies that, that it can be proven that it's a lie and it's still published. And something like that happened four, five, six weeks ago. Um, but the PKK does now in the east, in the southeast, is they put up roadblocks. And for example, a bus pas with passengers is coming, they stop the bus, everybody has to get out and they check everybody's identity. And usually they also give some, you know, some speech about PKK ideology and then people can go again might take a few hours. And uh, PKK usually doesn't have any problem with people taking pictures of that or recording it, putting it on YouTube, whatever. You can find these videos. And there was, there was a, 
picture, I saw the original picture. There was a line of people, bus passengers, standing in front of the bus. Well, there was one woman in her 20s, she was standing like this, with her, with her head bowed down like this. And she was dressed like me, jeans and, you know, shirt, like this. And there was one, from, the, from his back was one PKK guy, was visible. A government paper took her, photoshopped her out of the picture, and, and the PKK guy as well, and put them in a landscape somewhere on a mountain. And they photoshopped some other PKK guys around it. And they photoshopped a bomb around her waist. And the, it was on the front page. And the accompanying story was the PKK drugged this woman and they forced her to be a suicide bomber for the PKK. And she was recognizable. So two or three days later on DKEN, this independent website that I also write for, I, I, I saw that this woman was, th the family thought of moving away from where they were living because now the community thought she was a drug addict and that she was close to PKK, all these things. And that's, and you cannot, the papers cannot be held accountable for that because you could only ha hold them accountable and criticize them and, and it leading somewhere if, this, if they make journalistic choices like The Guardian does or like papers in my country do or like The New York Times, they make journalistic choices. But in, in Turkey, there are hardly any media that make journalistic choice. This is not a journalistic choice, of course. There's nothing to do with journalism. So you can't in any way have a debate about how the press is working because it's, it's just as polarized as the whole country is and nobody's ever, hardly ever, anybody's making a journalistic choice in media. I mean, uh, that's terrible. And, and usually we define press freedom in Turkey by um, how many, how many journalists are in jail, um, how many people are fired from their jobs, this kind of figures, oh, it's getting worse, and did this many um, law cases against uh, Tagaf newspaper, against Jumuriyet paper, oh, it's getting out of hand. It is getting out of hand, but then you can, if you, if you make it a little bit bigger, like, what's the problem? There's no journalistic tradition, not at all, and journalism is not debated not debated at all, and that, that contributes to the problem, of course. Um, so if I criticize these lies, I'm, I'm again framed, framed as a terrorist friend, and many of my colleagues who are still in the, in the uh, foreign journalist group, they cannot really speak out because they're of they, they, are, they have a tie to the, to the paper that they work for, so they cannot really express their opinions or speak out the way I do. So I do, and then I'm a terrorist friend. But I, I try to criticize the mistakes in Kurdish media too, but you know, they don't lie that, that terribly. <laughs> so I only caught, caught them lying once when I went to a PKK funeral in Diyarbakir, and they said tens of thousands of people said goodbye to the PKK fighter. I thought maybe three, four thousand maybe. So when you see figures in the <laughs> Kurdish media, you have to take a zero off usually. So I think, Slowly, slowly, by by um, changing my my journalism, by more more um, yeah, going back to the core of journalism, which is seeking the truth. I I sort of made my position um, impossible in Turkey, and it started with my arrest, of course, in in January by the anti-terrorism police, and I was I was totally flabbergasted when that happened. Th they record they have to record the whole process of searching your house and because you know for legal reasons that they did everything according to the to the rules and that they didn't uh, hit me or whatever so i opened the door and immediately the um recording started and i never saw the video back but i think the first minute i'm only like what i couldn't say anything i was only like jaw dropping surprised um and and I sort of took it light, even when it happened. I was, I was in shock for, for a few minutes. And then the, the, the leader of this group of police said, told me, like, you know, cool down, it's OK. And I got angry at him. I said, you, you, you come in, you with the anti-terrorism squad, and you tell me to cool down. But I thought, hey, it's a good advice, actually. Because usually, as a journalist, you, you don't get to see such house searches. You only read about it in, in Kurdish media. So I thought, hey, you know, I should look at this closely. So you can nicely, I leaned against the doorpost and look like, hey, what are they interested in? What are they filming? I also have this 
this big book, I don't know if you know it, um, Kurdistan in the Shadow of History, Susan Maisilas. It's a really, it's a big book with a lot of beautiful pictures, beautiful book. Um, and I think it has a picture of Öcalan on it. So they were going through this book and then they said to the guy with the camera, come, 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 come. And they, you know, f film that picture of Öcalan, you know. It's like a, like a um, evidence against me. But I, I, I took it, um, I took it kind of light and my, it was in the beginning of the year, so that's in Turkey always uh, every year you have to renew your press card and renew your residence permit. And that was kind of a pain in the ass this year, the residence permit, but eventually I got it in uh, end of April. So I thought, oh, everything's fine again. They let me stay and I was acquitted. And okay, the court case is ongoing because the prosecutor appealed, but I thought, no, everything is fine again. I did think like, hey, I'm now the only prosecuted journalist in Turkey who has one case against her. That's strange. Maybe a second case will be coming, but I never thought they would, they would throw me out. Um, I've, I've always felt protected by being a European journalist. I thought Erdogan doesn't really want a big, really big problem with the EU by starting to throw European journalists out. And maybe it was that way two, three years ago. I've always had a little bit trouble with the residence permits. But apparently, Turkey cares less and less about what Europe would think about their actions. And, and they are right, because Europe doesn't really care. Look, Merkel went there, they make some sort of a terrible deal that doesn't serve anybody, let, let alone Syrian refugees. Um, so I felt somehow still a little bit protected by being European journalist and, and having all my papers in order, but I think um, I have had my head in the sand a little bit too, not wanting to realize that they might throw me out. Um, but also I've been working. It, the, the, the prosecution that started in January, it, it was mainly, it, I, I didn't feel intimidated or something, and I wasn't scared, but it was really annoying. It took a lot of time that I could have used to write stories. I want to write, so when that was, when the acquittal came, and then I could focus on my work again. So I started traveling again, making stories again. So I, I you can't think all the time, like, are they going to throw me out? Then you can't work properly. But now I'm here and tomorrow I'm flying back, but not to Ahmed, but to Amsterdam, which is really breaking my heart. But, um, well, it, it all goes back, I think, to, that, to this first time I went to Roboski and, and everything that I've done and, and developed since then. But I only know that now, I didn't know that at the time, but if I would have known at the time that it would lead to this, I don't think I would have done it differently because I, you know, I need as a journalist just to do my job. If this is what it leads to, then, you know, so be it, what can I do? Thank you.